Warning, we haven't gotten any less vulgar since last week. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Aura Frames, Honey, and by the upcoming Zelda sequel where Link just lets Hyrule deal with its own shit but still pretends he's helping, Legend of Zelda, Prayers of the Kingdom. Prayers of the Kingdom. Because the Zelda references have shown up earlier and earlier in every episode, so this was bound to happen eventually. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hi. I'm Matthew Cutler, I'm an autistic atheist variety streamer on Twitch, and this week it's my turn to tell you that we did invite evolve from filthy monkey people. It's Thursday. It's June 8th. And it's the Festival of Corpus Christi. Nice. Cannibals on parade. Fantastic. <laughs> no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Treason Links, Bedminster, New Jersey, <laughs> and Armour, Michigan, and Waycross, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, Governor Holchel flickers into existence for a brief second of mattering. Anti-choice Republicans in Oregon threaten to take their nothing and go home. And we'll talk to a former shiny happy person. But first, the diatribe. I feel like Christians must think that the entrance exam to get into atheism is grueling as hell, right? Because the second you tell them you're an atheist, they expect you to be an expert on every single subject that ever earned its own ology. I was recently on the Sunday show with Matt Dillahunty. We were talking about this phenomenon, and this is how it goes. You're like, oh, I don't believe in God. They're like, oh, you don't believe in God, huh? So where does the universe come from? So yeah, man, thanks for for keeping your ask so manageable, but okay. All right, now I got to go. I got to learn about cosmology to justify my atheism. That's all right. I'm interested in space shit anyway. Let me go do that. Then you come back and it's like, oh, you don't believe in God. So you so you think we came from monkeys. All right, well, now I got to add biology, apparently. And then it's, oh, you don't believe in God. Well, how do you explain this layer of sediment in the earth if it's billions of years old? So we add geology. And then how do you explain this account in the Bible? So we add, we got to add ancient history. And what about this biblical prophecy that clearly predicted this modern event? So we got to add textual criticism. And then where do you get your morals from? So we add ethical philosophy. And then where do you get meaning from? So we add all the other philosophy. And then how, how do you explain this experience that my cousin says she had when she was 14 years old? And you're like, for fuck's sake, I've already got two full course loads here. But here's the thing, as I'm sure you're already aware, there is no entrance exam for atheism, and we're not obligated to know about any of that shit. As atheists, we're not making any claims about any of that stuff other than, I don't think it was God. When somebody asks you, where did the universe come from? The only answer you owe them as an atheist from a logical perspective is, well, not a magical ghost. And that's assuming you owe him any answer at all, which, given how frequently we encounter these questions in bad faith, is a mighty big assumption. Now, of course, it's not always a deliberate obfuscation. Sometimes it is. William Lane Craig famously tries to debate history with philosophy experts, science with history experts, and philosophy with science experts. But more often than not, those are just the questions that first occur to the theist to ask you. After all, for most believers, their religion underpins everything in their lives. I don't know anybody who would say that about their atheism. Like I, I record multiple shows every week about atheism. I have for a decade. I attend atheist conventions. I have a drawer full of atheist t-shirts. I've written three books about atheism. And even I wouldn't reserve as high a place in my day-to-day life for atheism as the, even like the average lukewarm Christian would for God. See, for an awful lot of incurious religious folks, the answer to every question is God did it. When they reach the end of their intellectual curiosity, which is often a mighty short road with these folks, there's a sign there that just says God did it. So before they can even consider your worldview, they need a replacement answer for pretty much every fucking question that there is. Their indiscriminate prance through the course catalog seems perfectly logical if you consider it from that admittedly already illogical perspective. But that still doesn't mean that you owe them polymathery. 
I, I know I get sucked into these kind of arguments constantly because I'm actually interested in cosmology, biology, ancient history, philosophy, etc. And I also get that I'm very often asked these questions with perfect sincerity. So I start to feel like my ability to sell evolution or the Big Bang might actually be the difference between someone becoming an atheist or maintaining the voluntary yoke of religion. The pressure's on, right? But in truth, most of the time, I'd probably be better off sending them to an expert in whatever field they're asking about and instead simply emphasizing the fact that God isn't a beauty pageant runner-up who gets to step in if the Big Bang is unable to fulfill its duties as a theory of cosmogenesis. And sure, it's a source of constant frustration for vocal atheists being called upon to know a dozen disparate subjects per argument, especially because there doesn't seem to be any corresponding obligation on the part of the theist who keeps bringing them up. But it's also a great way to highlight just how many academic subjects religious thinking is out of line with. And if we can make our interlocutors see that, it'll probably be way more impactful than any specific question we might answer for them about natural selection. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the Drogon and Rhaegal, the My Viserion, Heath Enright, and Eli <laughs> Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to burn this shit down? Daenerys was right. Absolutely, she was right. I was rooting for her the whole time. John shot first. Oh, Jesus Christ. She was right. Oh, see, I thought he was referencing the fact that people are disappointed when we finish. In which case, fair. You know, fair. <laughs> uh, Both? All right, well, if we're going to end this intro as bad as Game of Thrones ended, at least one of us needs to shit ourselves. So while we take care of that, <laughs> we're going to take a break for a word from this week's first sponsor, Aura Frames. No, no, trust me. Wind Temple, Fire Temple, Water, which is, is the best, and then Lightning. But I want to check out the depths. You're not ready for the depths. Come hey, on. guys. Uh, what's going on? <laughs> not much, dude. What's with the, uh, the ski goggles? Oh, you mean my Apple Visions? There Seriously? Is 100% unsurprised. So you like got them early or something? <laughs> I wish. No, Heath, these are just ordinary ski goggles that I rounded out on a lathe. But once Apple Vision takes over the vision space... Please don't just make up words like once that. Once Apple Vision takes over the vision space, what's going to be the hardest part? Uh, drowning out other people's laughter? No, no. It's going to be getting used to wearing goggles all the time. So I'm starting now so I can be ahead of the curve. So, wait, so you're looking ridiculous before you need to. <laughs> okay, come on, guys. These are awesome. I'm going to be able to watch movies and use apps. I can look at photos of my kid whenever I want. Okay, all right. One, the Quest, which you already have, does all those things. But, but two, if you want a better way to look at pictures of your kid, why not try an Aura Frame? Oh, this is an ad for an aura frame. Yeah, glad to hear it. I thought we were just dunking on the goggles for a second there. I was like, is this? Yeah, we I, I mean, we could. Did you hear it's going to be $3,500? $3,500. Literally the price of a high-end computer and a VR headset. Yeah, combined. Yeah, guys, combined. guys, guys, guys. Aura frames? Yeah, right. sorry. What are the, those are great. What are the aura frames? Looking for a gift for dad that he won't want to return? What if you could put all your photos, including those random camera roll pics, in a place where he can actually see them? Then get him a Wi-Fi connected digital frame from Aura. It's the perfect gift for Father's Day. This is not the digital picture frame you remember from the early 2000s. There are no USB or SD cards. And there's no hassle. With free unlimited storage, instantly frame photos and videos from any device anywhere in the world and invite the whole family in on the fun through the free Aura app. You can even preload photos and a personal video message that will display as soon as the frame is connected. It's true. I actually bought an Aura frame because I heard about it on another podcast and I gave it to my mom as a gift and she loves it. Unlimited pictures of my kid. She can even like them and scroll through on the frame. It looks really nice. So right now, Aura has a great deal for Father's Day. Listeners can save by visiting AuraFrames.com slash scathing. That's A-U-R-A frames.com slash scathing. Use the code scathing to get $30 off plus free shipping on their best-selling frames. The deal ends on June 18th, so don't wait. Terms and conditions apply. All right, Noah, thanks. Ah, sorry. Um, Did goggles hurt your face? Yeah, yeah, but it's okay. The Apple ones only have a battery that lasts two hours. Two hours. <laughs> it's okay, you can plug it in. Oh, you can plug it in. <laughs> and now, back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, 
The Oklahoma School Board approved what will be America's first publicly funded religious charter school this week in a move that even the state attorney general calls unconstitutional. The state attorney general of Oklahoma. Of Oklahoma fucking Homa. Yes. This is yeah. a state next to Arkansas where Sarah Huckabee Sanders is in charge. Yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. And also next to Texas where no fucking body's in charge. So so this came after a months long fight between the governor and the First Amendment, which the governor won by appointing more agreeable lackeys to the school board, apparently. So, yeah, unless secular advocacy groups can strangle this in its grave, the St. Isidore of Seville Virtual Catholic Charter School operated directly by the Catholic Archdiocese of Oklahoma City and the Diocese of Tulsa, will become the first religious school in the nation funded entirely by taxpayer dollars. And the prank war begins. Thank you. You come on to my internet with this shit? <laughs> oh, they just stepped into the domain name Thunderdome, St. <laughs> Isidore Seville Virtual Catholic. I mean, allegedly. Whatever I have to say that makes laws not real. It's allegedly. Yeah, right. right. There's one of those, one of those phrases. Uh, so Christian. First of all, <laughs> well done. So first of all, Quick thanks to Bruce, who was the first to send us this story at scathingnews at gmail.com. Yeah, I also got an email from my mom about this one. <laughs> it just had the link and it said, get your shit together. Right. As if like, <laughs> I have to like D up with atheism. Like we got to talk to my boys at atheism <laughs> and deal with this. Wait, wait, wait. Gentlemen, are you telling me that based on those two stories, if listeners send us atheist news to scathingnews at gmail.com, statistically, Heath will be capable of loving 50% of them? <gasps> what? I He does have you there. Keith. Ah, damn it. Does he? Yeah. Kind the of. math checks out. But of course, we've also been following this story since April when the board first unanimously rejected the archdiocese's application. But after applying an overbroad interpretation of the already quasi-constitutional Supreme Court decision Carson v. Macon, that's the decision from last year that forced Maine to make supplementary funds available to religious schools, they were able to convince two-fifths of the board and the governor who got to appoint the fifth-fifth that it was legal. So as of this week, they're going to go ahead with it. Yeah, but they might find sign up a little difficult because when you Google St. Whatever Online Rape Your Kids Academy, mm -hmm. you don't actually get their website till page seven. Oh, really? <laughs> seven of the Google results is where you actually get the school. Now, it's easy to lose track of how bad this is because of the various incremental steps that we've been taking towards it over the last few years. But make no mistake, this would be a huge step beyond the already egregious violations that we've seen. We're talking about redirecting an estimated $23.3 million of taxpayer funds away from secular schools and towards explicitly religious ones. That's over the next five years. In Oklahoma, yeah. where the schools probably aren't doing great. I would imagine the public schools there. Yeah, right. Right. And and these, of course, religious schools are not required to, for example, certify their teachers. Cool. Or hire LGBTQ people or not fire someone for getting pregnant. Gross. And by the way, I should point out that twenty three point three million dollars over five years. That's their estimate. So that's the low ball. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, we're talking about Oklahoma. That's like two hundred million dollars in today's money. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, each student needs a fan to simulate the wind coming sweeping down the plane, you see. Yeah, right, right. No, at this point. <laughs> now, of course, <laughs> several groups are already mounting legal challenges, including Americans United for Separation of Church and State, whose president Rachel Laser said of the move, quote, Ooh. it's hard to think of a clearer violation of the religious freedom of Oklahoma taxpayers and public school families than the state establishing the nation's first religious public charter school, end quote. But perhaps the most impactful criticism of the decision came from Oklahoma's attorney fucking general, who said it was clearly contrary to state law and could open the state to costly legal action. Yeah, from somebody named Laser. Y'all are in trouble. That's a gladiator. An right, American. no, she'll kick like, your zap. fucking ass. Yeah. yeah. Also, imagine thinking the worst thing about destroying the separation of church and state is this is going to cause some legal fees. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, it is Oklahoma and he is a Republican, so that's the best we can hope for. And in epic shell phones news. <laughs> nice. Thanks to a book banning law from the Utah legislature. A public school district just removed all the King James Bibles from the shelves of their elementary school and middle school libraries because <laughs> fuck your face. This is awesome. I, well, yeah, I know this is fun because they're biting themselves in the ass here. But for realities, 
if any other book advocated murdering your kids to appease God or prescribed a fair market price for rape, it wouldn't have been on elementary and middle school library shelves to begin with, right? This is actually a book we should ban from those schools. Yeah, yeah broken clock and all that. <laughs> right, well, yeah, right, right, exactly. All right, well, a big thanks to Zena and also like 200 other people who sent us the story, scathingnews, gmail.com, good stuff. He loves 50% of you. Yeah, okay. 100.5 of you. An even bigger thanks to all the piece of shit Republican lawmakers who made this all possible. He loves 0% of you. Yeah. Zero. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so last year, they passed HB 374, making it illegal for any public school to have sensitive materials in the curriculum or the library. And of course, the plan was to use that for banning all the propaganda of the woke agenda in their heads. For example, fictional gay penguins, like in the graphically sexual children's book and Tango Makes Three. Now, I haven't read that book, but I'm assuming these two father penguins are just railing each other the <laughs> whole time, right? Yep. Yeah, can confirm, can confirm. A lot okay. of penguin felching in that one. And felching. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay, like flipper stuff. So... In order to deal with that very real problem of the uh, fictional penguins, HB 374 defined sensitive material to include pornographic or indecent content because <laughs> these lawmakers are idiots and they forgot how that language applies perfectly to the Bible. But one hero of a parent did not forget and submitted an official request to ban the Bible. We talked about this a couple months ago. And that included an eight-page list of Bible verses that mention topics like incest, bestiality, prostitution, genital mutilation, fellatio. <laughs> Notably not cunnilingus, though, which is very telling mm. that only one of those is in the Bible. Also, rape, infanticide, dildos, and masturbation. See, I don't remember the fellatio and dildo parts of the Bible, and I feel like I would. Huh. Yeah, I don't think that's what you are my rod and my staff means. I hate to get it, it could be. It could be. <laughs> I could just be misinterpreting it. And uh, just a reminder, this hero of Utah also added the following to that complaint about the Bible. They wrote, quote, I thank the Utah legislature and Utah Parents United for making this bad faith process so much easier and way more efficient. Now we can all ban books and you don't even need to read them or be accurate about it. Heck, you don't even need to see the book, end quote. And that's, that's all true. That's how it works now. Well, the Davis School District got together for a meeting, as required by the stupid fucking law, and they decided that kids should be reading about, you know, incest, bestiality, genital <laughs> mutilation at Al, but not until ninth grade. They, they left it in the high school. It's an interesting oh, line in the uh -huh. sand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So what if we told them we would bring back mandatory prayers in schools, but only if drag queens come in to lead them? Do you think their heads Ooh. would explode? <laughs> and if they did, would we be able to be criminally charged for that, you think? No, no. You have to say allegedly. I said earlier. Alleged, can we allegedly alleged be criminally Christian. charged? Christian. <laughs> <Christ doesn't count. laughs> so it actually gets even better. The latest complaint is asking for a ban on the Book of Mormon. Oh, in interesting. Utah. And the school district already announced approximate quote, we're forming a committee to evaluate the Book of Mormon at a secret location. We own guns. And <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, tight as a dish always did sound sexual to me. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and in Hochul Horses News. We have a bit of good news from Heath and Mines, home state of New York. That That is your, your home state that neither of you live in? Home is where the heart is, Noah. Go Yankers! Yan Yankees. Whose side are you on? <laughs> <It's> Anyways, <laughs> Yankees. Regular listeners may remember that way back on episode 315, New York State Governor Kathy Hochul, a woman so forgettable she's legally invisible, vetoed a bill that would have allowed defendants in possession, distribution, or DUI cases the right to a non-religious substance abuse treatment option in their sentencing. And it appears that second time's the charm, however, as a new and improved bill has just passed the state house and is headed to Kathy Hochul's desk, hopefully, to be fucking signed this time. Okay, why are we letting people from upstate New York have power in New York? <laughs> what is happening? I know she's the first female governor of the state. That's good. And she's a Democrat, but a Buffalo 
Democrat. Thank Absolutely you. Not. Get the yeah, fuck no, out of here. That's almost Canadian. Yeah. She might as well be a forest Put out your fire. forest you have fire. To, like, t- how do you get from Rockaway to Harlem right now? Too slow. Exactly. <laughs> Can't do it. Absolutely not. Exactly. You have no power in New York. The E? It's the A train. Oh, it's the A. Okay. <laughs> All right. The quickest way to Harlem. No, you're right. You're right. I was, I was thinking of E. I, was like, I, was, I know it's a vowel. I know it's one of the vowels. It's blue. It's blue. Now, you might be wondering why Hoach Magoch vetoed the bill in the first place. Well, go fuck yourself. That's why. Yeah. Her office never even attempted to provide an explanation. However, Assemblyman Harvey Epstein, the unfortunately named sponsor of the bill, promised mm-hmm. to write a new one that says, pretty please at the top with communications from organizations like American Atheists. It seems like this new bill will pass. Okay, but why does it seem like that? Like, I'm glad that's true, maybe, but why does Kathy Hochul like need to be unplugged and plugged back in like a router to do it again. What the fuck happened? I'll I'll tell you what happened. She got to look at fucking Jeff Blackwell's quads and realize she wasn't ready to go toe to toe with that machine. They are cut. Exactly. I heard Jeff told her, quote, the only way I could destroy you more is with the power of my lovemaking. And she signed on the spot. (laughs) That's what I heard. That sounds like something he would say. Yep. Anyways, as we mentioned the original story, this practice just, for the record, was already illegal, right? Right. The bill doesn't make secular recovery programs available for the first time. Instead, it just eliminates the step where secular defendants have to sue the state and win in order to be given a non-religious alternative. This bill is more about ending the waste of everyone's time and money than anything else. And yet, there will still be people learning about their options for the first time because of this bill. There will be defendants who won't just go along with whatever they're sentenced to in hopes of not pissing off their judge. A risk that we've learned on this podcast many times is very real. So, yeah, I mean, however late it may be, this is indeed good news. All right. Well, it's very rare that I get to introduce a sponsor on an up note. So we're going to take that opportunity to pause from a word from our second sponsor this week. Honey. Hey, podcast listener. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And I'm No Illusions. Today's episode is sponsored by PayPal Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. But did you know it only takes a few seconds to get it? That means if you go to add it to your laptop or iPhone right now, you could be done before this ad read is even over. We'll even help you do it. Here, open your browser right now. Wait, wait, wait. what if they're driving? You can do stuff on your phone while you're driving. Nope, you sure can't. don't, Don't do that. I mean, you can, though. I no, know moving on, can. moving on. Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. What do you do if you get a text message? Imagine, imagine you're shopping one of your favorite sites. When you check out, the Honey button appears, and all you have to do is click Apply Coupons. Wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons it can find for that site. If Honey finds a working coupon, you'll watch the prices drop. So you pull over if you get a text message while you're driving? No, it's insane. Just don't answer it. What? Why, yes, Heath and Eli, honey has saved me money. I use it when shopping online, and I've saved money on everything from food delivery to Christmas baskets for friends of the show. And honey doesn't just work on desktop. It also works on your iPhone, too. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and save on the go. While you're driving. Not while you're driving. Getting honey seriously only takes a few seconds. And by getting it, You'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting the show. Get PayPal Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash scathing. That's joinhoney.com slash scathing. Honey, please drive carefully. Missing out on savings. No, you can do it when you get home. Or not. And in pride cometh all over thy tits news. The Christian television phenomenon let Chosen, which you may recall from purposely vandalizing their own billboards last year in a marketing campaign designed to cash in on Christianity's persecution fetish, is currently filming their fourth season, and they decided to tease fans of the show with a little behind-the-scenes featurette last week, but visible at the extreme left of the screen and occupying less than 4% of the total visible area for literally three seconds of a a six-and-a-half-minute video was... A pride flag, Anna. What are the guys talking about? It's the newest, the greatest Christian freakout. That's right. Christians are (laughs) furious over the lack of sufficient bigotry on set. Turning Point USA blogger John Root was the first to draw attention to this in a tweet where he highlights the tiny, barely visible smudge of spectrum and says, quote, 
hey, at the Chosen TV, can you explain why there's a pride flag on set? End quote. <laughs> the comment section of the video itself is predictably filled with elaborations on Root's concerns, including multiple demands for apologies to Christian viewers, calls for boycotts, and threats to withdraw funding from the almost entirely crowdfunded program because a person who works on the show supported a human right. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the new game, this is going to be fun. Sneaking rainbow stuff into every single Christian production of anything ever that you have access to. <laughs> yep, exactly. Photons mm -hmm. are already being dispatched. And Fuck yeah. so many Heath points for anybody who pulls off a good one. Seriously, make it happen. I was going to say, not to give direct instructions, but I know we have a listener who works on David A.R. White movies and TV yep. shows. <laughs> yep. You didn't get sure us into does. God's Not Dead 3, man. Come on, you owe us. Yeah, right. Exactly. You owe us. Promise is broken. Just keep changing your shirt and like it spells <laughs> out a rainbow over Ooh, time. Oh, just Roy G. Don't Bivet it. on them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, for their part, the show's producers have not apologized, but they also haven't expressed the slightest modicum of support for the gay crew member whose flag it was or for the basic human rights that the flag stands for. Instead, they validated the bigotry by saying that that one person's pride flag, quote, doesn't speak for everyone, end quote. And look, as a crowdfunded project that relies on atheist support, we often joke about how much more money we would make if we decided to find Jesus. So it's actually, it's kind of nice to be reminded once in a while what a fucking curse it is to cater to a Christian audience. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and finally tonight, in epic self-Oregon news, Oregon, <laughs> the Christian right block of the Oregon Senate has decided they'd rather die than allow uterine autonomy. And I think that is so brave of them. I love this. <laughs> they should definitely keep doing that. Just, just lose all their jobs right in our fucking faces or literally die. Whatever, whatever y'all are thinking mm -hmm. is super cool. Love this brave. Mm -hmm. But seriously, that appears to be their plan. 13 anti-choice lunatics have been refusing to show up for any voting in order to prevent the required quorum and keep delaying a bill that would codify Roe into state law. But if any lawmaker rings up 10 unexcused absences in Oregon, they're no longer eligible for re-election. <laughs> These people do not seem to understand how this works at all. <laughs> Look, folks, I know it's weird that we have rules describing the appropriate length of the pouty conniption fits by which we govern our nation, but we do. We actually do have those <laughs> they're there. rules. We do. Yeah, Oregon does at least. So thanks to Weston for the link, skatingnews at gmail.com. Keith loves half of so, you, Weston. Yeah, yeah okay. You. So mm -hmm. here's the backstory. <laughs> Heading into last year's election, Republicans made a big push to overthrow the Democratic majority in the Oregon State Senate for the first time in 20 years. And they got some huge financial support, including from local billionaire Phil Knight. He's the founder of Nike named after the Greek goddess of victory. So they lost big anti-Nike on that. <laughs> Democrats held the Senate. And another thing that happened in that election, Oregon voters approved Measure 113, which amended the state constitution to include that rule about 10 unexcused absences. And also on top of that, just for spite, Senate President Democrat Rob Wagner also added a fine of $325 for each day they miss. Oh, nice. I mean, not getting paid for the days that you refuse to show up for work because you're in a snit wouldn't normally be classified as a fine, but call it whatever you got to <laughs> right. call it. Nor a spiteful boss. It's just like, no, uh, I'll pay you when you're here at work. Right. Can't help but notice you gentlemen are bringing this up right before my vacation. Just say what you want to say, okay? All right, so we're also bringing it up right after I took a week off to play Zelda. So who? I don't know who this is directed at, honestly. <laughs> so that brings us to last month when Democrats in the state Senate proposed a bill that would protect abortion access and gender-affirming health care. Anna? That's right. Of course, the Christians had a freak out about that. And those 13 Republicans refused to show up for work at their jobs of fucking work in order to block the two-thirds quorum that's required to vote on a bill. And now, 10 of those 13 Republicans, and counting, have gone over the absence limit and they cannot be reelected. And just for context, the entire state Senate is 30 people. Well, mm. But also important context, they can only lose this battle. 
Yep. <laughs> right. Like there's there's literally no way for them to win anything here. Not gonna happen. Okay, but what about the loyalty from voters who can't elect them that they yeah, just right. <laughs> <laughs> try running for governor, all of you. Yeah. Ooh, as a team. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of team, these idiots are calling themselves the Oregon 13. Oh, because, fuck you. Yeah, because their situation, it's just like being wrongfully jailed during the civil rights movement. Same, same thing, same thing. Right. And they set up the Oregon 13 Constitutional Defense Fund, hoping to crowdfund a free speech legal challenge against that democratically approved state law during which the people freely spoke at the ballot box. And apparently... That is a super dumb idea, even within our absurd legal system of 2023. According to Sandy Chung, the executive director of the ACLU, which would normally help with free speech cases, quote, go fuck yourself. Or it was something very <laughs> similar. That. I don't think that was exactly it. All right. Well, I guess I need to add not showing up for work to my running list of nonsense things Republicans have tried to cram under the umbrella of free speech. So we're going to close the headlines there. <laughs> Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Basic freedoms. And when we come back, this music will fade back out. Trigger warning. The following interview includes discussions of emotional, psychological, and physical abuse. Listener discretion is advised. Every once in a while, the mainstream media glances up from whatever vampire superhero reboot prequel they're regurgitating and realizes that there's this huge group of Christians openly trying to subvert our government and replace it with a Handmaid's Tale-style dystopia, and maybe they should acknowledge that. Well, such is the case with Shiny Happy People, an amazing new documentary miniseries on Amazon Prime that looks at the dark side of the Duggar family of ex-teen kids and counting fame, as well as the IBLP, the fundamentalist ministry that undergirds their twisted family dynamic. Well, among the voices featured on this series is that of my guest tonight. Chad Harris grew up in the IBLP. He shares his experiences on TikTok under the account Arch Radish, as well as on this documentary. And he's here tonight to share them with us. So, Chad, thanks for coming on the show. And thanks for everything that you're doing to expose this abusive lunacy. Oh, thanks for having me, Noah. And hey, it's a huge honor to talk to you. I've been listening for years. Right on, right on. Well, yeah, you know, we met a couple of years ago at the American Atheist Convention in Atlanta. I believe you were there on the TikTok panel. Is that correct? I was not on that panel, but a lot of my friends were. I'm uh, good friends, well, with pretty much everybody on that panel. But I've been telling my story on TikTok for quite some time, and we've all kind of gathered a little community around that. We all have different experiences, of course, you know, and how we were engaged with religion, you know, before we all became atheists or before we all became publicly known as atheists. And yeah, they're just a really great bunch. I really am proud of them. Yeah, I've met some amazing people. It's, it's always like that at these conventions. You you meet so many amazing people and you're like, okay, well, that's 27 people I need to interview. And then, <laughs> yeah, some of them take a little while. So, okay, so obviously one could spend four hour long episodes answering this question and just really scratch the surface. But in broad strokes, for people who haven't seen the documentary, can you tell us what is the IBLP? Is it a church? Is it a religion? What, what, what even is this? It's so much bigger than any of those things, actually. It's an entire organization it was started in the 60s and 70s by a man named Bill Gothard, who essentially just as a graduate from Wheaton College, came up with this idea for a system he called the Institute in Basic Youth Conflicts, where he took a whole bunch of the societal upheaval that came about through, you know, integration, through the uh, feminist movement, through all the different movements of the 60s and 70s, civil rights and what have you, and determined that to try to appeal to the conservative narrow-minded folks out there, that the real problem with America was that people were disrespecting authority. And if the youth of today would just start to learn to respect authority again, then our country would be great. And if that sounds familiar, it's the same song, different verse today. But he was doing it before it was cool, as it were. So he started the Institute in Basic Youth Conflicts in the 60s and 70s, and eventually expanded that into the Institute in Basic Life Principles, which came about when he developed his idea of core principles that every Christian needed to have in their life to be successful. From there, he stumbled into the homeschooling movement in the 70s and 80s, and that was when things really took off when he expanded it into the Advanced Training Institute of America, or ATIA. And that was when IBLP really hit the biggest that they've ever been in 
well, frankly, in, in their entire history. So I want to hear more about your story growing up around this. So first of all, did you grow? This is obviously heavily associated with the Duggar family. Did you grow up in one of these huge quiverful families? Not at first. I grew up in a relatively normal, and I say that in the broadest terms possible, relatively normal independent fundamental Baptist family. My dad was an independent fundamental Baptist preacher. And I was actually the fourth of four children to start with. I was kind of born sometime after my older brother. I was an unplanned child, and my folks took the opportunity to let me know that at every moment they could. But when I was about six or seven years old, my mother went to an OBGYN who convinced her to join the Quiverful movement. And for those not familiar, Quiverful is just simply the idea that Christians should try to take over the world by overpopulating it. The idea is that you have a Quiverful of arrows, aka children, that you're able to shoot out against Satan and you should trust God to give you as many arrows or ammunition as possible to do so. So this actual OBGYN told my mother that she should consider turning over how many children that she had to the Lord. And so, yeah, seven years after I was born, I had two younger siblings. And so I became the fourth of six. So it was one of the things that was really heavily promoted in the IBLP, because from the Quiverful movement, we went straight into the IBLP itself. The IBLP borrowed a lot of ideas from the Quiverful movement, and Bill Gothard taught that you know having as many children as possible would bring about the societal change and the respect of authority that he had been teaching all along. Matter of fact, they didn't touch on this a whole lot in the documentary, but they would actually have entire choirs full of children that were purported to have been born from reverse vasectomies. So, you know, after after children were conceived, after the, the father had a reverse vasectomy, they would, you know, grow up and like train them to sing in these choirs to show like, see how many people have, you know, really um, answered the call of God or whatever. Wow. And it was just sick. <laughs> All right. So you've already touched on the homeschooling being sort of at the core of the growth of this organization. So can you tell me a little bit about your education? Were you pulled out of public schools to, to be homeschooled or were you always homeschooled? I was always homeschooled. My older siblings had all gone to either public or Christian school at some point in their lives. But my folks, even before we got into IBLP, decided to, you know, try to go ahead and homeschool me from the start. They had trouble finding a curriculum. And I believe that the move into ATI, the homeschooling branch of IBLP, came about because they were looking for something that would work for both my older brother and myself. Bill Gothard was a consummate salesman, and he promised that if you followed ATI, you would receive a pristine Christian education. You would even have enough education to qualify for pre-law and pre-med if you followed his bizarre-ass teachings. So I went from doing relatively normal Christian homeschooling stuff, which in and of itself is a whole subject, Mm -hmm. to going by these just weird ramblings of Bill Gothard in which he would take the entire Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and try to pull all these academic subjects out of every line of the Sermon on the Mount, which it, you can't do that. It's spoilers, but uh, no. yeah, it, all you end up doing is coming up with you know total nonsense. Now, obviously, I, I feel like I'd be remiss to talk about this subject at all without talking about the abuse fostered by IBLP. So to the extent that you're comfortable talking with us about it, of course— What kind of abuse did you experience and witness growing up around this organization? So IBLP was, you know, very focused on authority, like I said. And to really emphasize that, they would teach parents how to physically spank and I'll just go ahead and say it, abuse their children until they absolutely could not put up a resistance anymore. And this is one thing I know that they cover in the documentary, a concept called blanket training in which they would put infants on a blanket, entice them to crawl off of it and punish them when they did. I do remember seeing that growing up quite a bit. I was too old when we got in to really experience that myself. But I do remember that I was spanked and abused for long periods of time physically. And the goal, according to my folks, when they did it, was to get me to stop registering an emotional response at all. If I cried out, I would just be beaten until I didn't. If I expressed any kind of sadness, I would be beaten until I didn't. And I got really good at blocking out pain, which led to a lot of health effects later in life. I'll 
<laughs> you can just imagine. Yeah. But this was very common among a lot of kids I saw growing up. And I always felt like I kind of got off easy because I knew of other kids who were very, very much like physically harmed and in some cases, you know, developed even worse physical maladies throughout their entire life. And it was all in support of this idea that if you don't have an ultimate authority in your home, which in most cases would be, you know, whoever the oldest man was in the home, then everything would fall apart. So you had a divine mandate to hurt your children. It was just sick. Wow. Yeah. And and we're not even touching on the misogyny of it as, as well, which is, of course, a, a huge focus of the documentary. Certainly. So when did you first start thinking that there was something wrong with how you were being raised and these religious teachings? It really came after I became an adult. I didn't know very much. And another aspect of ATI and IBLP was that they really didn't encourage going to college at all or seeking any higher education. Your higher education was promised to come from some new scheme that Gothard would come up with by the time you got there, whether it be working at his many training centers across the world or at headquarters itself or going through whatever semblance of a medical or law school that they purported to have, you know, you weren't really encouraged to do higher education. So when I left home at 19, I really didn't have any direction where to go. And I started working for a fundamentalist church. And there was an abuse scandal that happened in that church. And I knew it was wrong. And I knew that the pastor of that church who perpetrated it was unfit for ministry but everyone ignored it and let him continue on as pastor. And that was when it really struck me that, hey, there is something bad wrong happening here. And I got to looking into a lot of the pastors that my dad idolized growing up. And this is about the time the internet became pretty ubiquitous in the late 2000s. And I started seeing all these stories of abuse and of just children being harmed and all these arrests that kept coming about. And I asked my dad about it, and he said, well, we just don't talk about things like that because it's bad for the ministry. And that was when I said, well, I didn't sign up to hurt people. And around this time, Bill Gothard was also accused of sexual harassment of many of his uh, workers. And I asked my dad about that, too, and he just refused to hear anything about it. And that was when it really started sinking in that. I'm involved in something that is built to harm people, and I'm being lied to about it. And that was when I really started to find my way out. I had already graduated. I was no longer in the homeschooling program, and Gothard himself didn't have a huge sway in my, my adult life, but the teachings did. Right. And everything I grew up with, I had to start questioning. And it was a long, hard deconstruction process, which, frankly, you know, led to a lot of questioning, a lot of seeking out how I can make religion work in my own life. And through resources like y'all's podcasts and just some amazing books, you know, that I've been recommended by friends and, you know, a combination of people just gently explaining things that I had never learned in school to me to also being allowed to make fun of the religious stuff that I had uh, been raised in. I now very openly and publicly identify as atheist and I could not be happier with that station in life. Awesome. Well, I'm you know glad that we could play some small role in comforting you on your way out. Now, I got the impression from the documentary that your family or much of your family is still in this. Yes, unfortunately, even if they aren't currently involved with IBLP or ATI, they're still very sympathetic toward it. Because one thing about fundamentalist Christianity institutions, if you start to question any of them, the whole thing falls apart. I'm living proof of that. Right. So they just refuse to hear it or will not hear it or think that every bad thing that's said about any of the stuff that they hold dear is an attack on them personally. So for my own sanity and the safety of everybody involved, I just, I've chosen to just, you know, go no contact with the vast majority of them. And, you know, we haven't really spoken in a long time. And it sucks, but freedom is a whole lot better. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm really sorry to, to hear that. Now, you used the word deconstruction. I think that's a great word for this process. So, so for you, what what has, you know, because you, this, this, Cult, it seems designed to turn women into victims and men into abusers and, and, and men yes. into victims as well as, you know, to the extent that it can. What has been the hardest thing for you to unlearn from your upbringing? That's a really good question. There was a, 
I don't have it with me right now, but there was a song that we were taught in Alert Cadet. And for background, Alert was the pseudo-military branch of Gothard's cult. I mean, this thing just went so many different directions. But Alert was the military-style branch where they would take young men and run them through obstacle courses and scream at them like Marines and stuff like that. And in order in order to toughen them up and, well, in my opinion, build what led to January 6th. Yeah. But there was a... Uh, a verse that we learned that we sang every day in the alert cadet program for younger kids. And the line was, we are casting down imaginations that rise up against God's hand and boldly bringing to subjection every thought to his command. So the goal of the cult was not only to bring you under subjugation and to bring women under subjugation to men and bring men under subjugation to Gothard himself, but also to make your own brain hold you in line. Like the idea was that your thoughts could not be trusted. So you had to constantly examine every single thought you had and make sure it was approved. Not just every word, deed, or action, but every thought could potentially be something that could cause you to be harmed. We were threatened with illness. We were threatened with bankruptcy. We were threatened with all these horrible things if we even had a stray thought that didn't fall in line with what the cult taught us. So it was really good at teaching us how to keep ourselves in line. And breaking out of that brainwashing was probably the worst part. Because, you know, as I was starting to question things, and, you know, when I first started, deconstruction wasn't even a term. Mm -hmm. I just uh, started out saying, well, everything I was raised with seems to be wrong on some level. So I'm just going to go back to the basics, which at that time was, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus. Let's just see what happens from there. And after a year of trying to make that fit, I had to tell myself, I'm going to have to break down what I believe even further, aren't I? (laughs) And that was the start of my journey to atheism. But even getting to that place where I could be comfortable questioning the very core beliefs that I was raised with, even as a child, my brain had done such a good job keeping me from ever doing that, that giving myself the freedom to do that was the first, the hardest, and the biggest hurdle. Wow. I, I, again, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm in awe of your ability to share this the story with us. And I know you're speaking to a lot of listeners that have very similar backgrounds. So I, I, I just don't want to thank you again for that. Now you've, you've kind of hinted at this and I, I would say like probably the most terrifying images, at least in the documentary are these shots of the alert Academy, this military wing of this cult. So I want to ask you explicitly, what is the end goal for IBLP? The end goal from IBLP, as they stated, was to, well, essentially world domination, as I said in the trailer and and in the uh, documentary itself. We were taught that we would be the generation that would bring America back to God and would eventually, you know, lead to a chain of events bringing on the second coming of Jesus Christ, where he could set up his kingdom here on earth. That was what we were taught. Now, personally, I believe that the real goal of IBLP was to make Bill Gothard rich. <laughs> right. But but that's not how it was sold to us. And when you, you know, get a bunch of impressionable young people, especially young men who are taught that, you know, they're inherently special because of the fact that they are men, they identify as men, they've been assigned that and they have some kind of spiritual authority over others and you run them through all these drills and all these things to try to you know build them up as like some kind of warrior for Christ and that is literally what they called us you know mm-hmm. we were called warriors we were called the christian marines they were like you know other christians are just lukewarm but you are the cream of the crop you are the ones who will absolutely bring on this new era of god it was i mean that's heady stuff especially when you know you're <laughs> for lack of a better term you're a dumb teenager You know, right. And to be instilled with this and to be told that you're better than everybody else, that is shocking. That is dangerous. And that is exactly what you see in organizations like the Proud Boys and similar groups today, because this shit works. Cults use these tactics over and over because they work. Yeah. And until we realize that we're not going to solve the problem of why it keeps happening. So now, is there anything that you wish had been included in the documentary that wasn't? Oh, there's so many. And I know that they couldn't get into everything. I 
100% am pleased with what they did cover. In four episodes, it's really hard to cover what you need to because anytime I've tried to explain this to folks, I sound like I have a push pin board yeah. with crazy strands of yarn going all over the place. Like, you gotta believe me, it's a cult. Well, it, it, there's so many acronyms. Yeah, and, yeah right. exactly. It was designed to be confusing. I, I thoroughly believe that. One thing that I wish that they had have gone into was more of the misogyny and more of how men were conditioned to be abusers. And for folks like me, who I never really matched up to what their <laughs> version of manliness was, I'm a boring straight white male, but I was also a very nerdy kid. I didn't have much interest in the outdoors or athletics or anything. You know, I had a Commodore 128 that I loved to play around on. And, Fuck, you know, yeah. that was my toy growing up, right? So when I was out there doing all this stuff with Alert Cadet, I very clearly did not do well. I failed at most of the obstacles. I fainted when I tried to rappel off the tower. And I was told that the reason that I failed at all this was because I was not spiritual enough. And it wasn't because I had any physical conditions or any kind of proclivities to not do this sort of thing. It was because I didn't study my Bible enough. And if I just had enough faith, I would be able to do all this. Well, that was complete and utter nonsense. But even though it never really quite worked with me because I just simply physically could not do all that, I do know of many other boys who were of my age who went all in on that to try to please Bill Gothard, their fathers, and to not be a disappointment. And they turned out to be very abusive people later on. And, yeah. you know, I, and I don't want to make this sound like, oh, the men had it so bad because as bad as we had it under those unrealistic expectations, women had it a million times worse because this organization was also meant specifically to harm women. The rules were much worse for young women and girls and everything. And as you see in the documentary, horrific abuse came about because of that. So I don't want to make light of that, but it was... There was just nothing that the cult touched that was not poisoned by their damn sense of authority and the and the organizational structure, the misogyny that was involved in it. It ruined everyone's life. So what do you I mean, I feel like there's there are several fairly obvious answers, but I'd still like to hear your opinion on this. What, what do you hope to accomplish by speaking out? First and foremost, I want the cult gone. It's been around long enough. It still exists today against all odds. And I think part of it is because they've enjoyed obscurity in plain sight. And one thing that really bothers me, and the reason I think that it has been able to exist for so long, is that many people tend to have blinders, especially in our society, where they think that anything religious is good on some level. Yeah. And I'm here to tell you, religion does not equal good. In cases like IBLP, Many people, especially, you know, when I was deconstructing and I was going to more mainstream churches and trying to get people to understand what I've been through, I had actual pastors telling me, well, yeah, but was it really that bad or was it just, you know, a little bit of a stricter version of Christianity that doesn't work for us, but it works for some people? And I was telling them, no, I was in a goddamn cult. Like, I right. wish you would listen. And now people are starting to maybe pick up a little bit on it. I have received tons of messages from people who have grown up in this, tons of people who said, I never realized it was as bad as it was. Well, that's because everyone treated it like, oh, well, it doesn't work for me, but you know, they seem happy. All these children seem so well behaved, especially with the Duggars being the poster children for this cult. Everyone looked at the Duggars, you know, oh, 19 kids, but they all love each other and everything runs so smoothly in their household and they right. clearly love each other while the cameras are on. And one thing that I love about how this documentary really pursues that is that they showed no, it was all a bunch of lies. And these lies permeated the entire cult, not just the one family. So I want the cult gone. I, I want them to be exposed for what they are. I want people to stop buying their materials. I want them to be shunned. I want them to be shut down because any other child that is hurt by the teachings of this cult and that man, Bill Gothard, is one child too many. I have said this from the time I started speaking out publicly till now. It needs to stop now. Another thing I want people to take away from this is to go back, look at the Christian nationalism problem we have in this country right now. If you go back far enough, you will find a nexus to IBLP and all of this. They have been 
playing this game since the 80s and 90s, and many powerful politicians, many powerful policymakers are embroiled in all this. I'll give you one example. Michael Ferris, who is the uh, leader of uh, Homeschool Legal Defense, which came along about the same time as ATI, had close ties with Bill Gothard from the very beginning. This was a man who actually co-wrote the 1776 project that Donald Trump himself commissioned. And it was overturned by Joe Biden on the very first day of the Biden administration. So these people who have been involved with this cult have had the ears of politicians all along. And the sooner we realize that and how that came about, the sooner I think we can address some of the problems we have today. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. And then that's the real shame of it is that the documentary, it, it really like talked a lot of that stuff. And, and again, I don't say this as a criticism to the documentarians. They were trying to cover a lot of stuff, but really it just stuck all that stuff in the last 10 minutes and like, oh, by the way, that's also the reason the country's burning down. <laughs> now, so given the demographics of our listenership, it's almost a guarantee that right now you're talking to people who are going through the same process as you went through and are continuing to go through and are far earlier in that process. So is there any advice that you want to offer to them while you've got their ear? I would like to say that getting out is an accomplishment in and of itself. And if you, if you're still in IBLP or if you're in a high controlling religion or cult and you need to get out as safely as you can, because I understand that there are a lot of people who simply cannot do it safety, but as safely as you can try to find resources and try to find people who will help. They do exist out there. And if you're in a position to where you are able to share your story and you are out, I would encourage you to consider doing so. Because, I mean, I'll be honest, I'm privileged city. You know, like I said, I'm a boring, straight white male and everything. And I have less to lose than a lot of people out there. So I figured, well, you know, it's if it can do some good, I'll share my story. But I really encourage anyone who has experienced this to go ahead, share your story on whatever platform you can. I did mine on TikTok, but there is just so many ways that you can get your voice out there. The more that we are able to go out there with our voices and to say this is wrong and people need to do something about it, the more chance we have of making a difference. Because ultimately what brings these organizations down is when enough people shine the light on them. The very reason they were able to perpetrate all this abuse for all this amount of time was because people like my dad said, we don't talk about this. And I'm here to say, if we do, it dies on the vine. Well, Chad, I, I think I, I speak for the entire audience when I express my admiration for your efforts to expose this shit and, and your willingness to to talk about, you know, some some pretty tough stuff. A quick reminder for the listeners that want to hear more from Chad, you'll find his TikTok channel linked on the show notes. And if you want to see the documentary, I highly recommend it. It's a tough watch, but it's something that everybody should see if they're able. Uh, look for Shiny Happy People, Duggar Family Secrets on Amazon Prime. Chad, thanks so much for your time. Noah, thank you so much. I really do appreciate this. Before we get back to exploring Hyrule tonight, I want... No, actually, I just want to get back to exploring Hyrule, so we're going to do this quick. That's all the blessing we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 Eastern on Tuesday, and an even new episode of our half-sister show Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I'd be the hostess with the leastest if I neglected to thank Heath Enright for putting up with almost four straight weeks of me talking about a video game he isn't playing. I need to thank Eli Bosnick for putting up with almost four straight weeks of me accidentally giving him spoilers for a video game he is playing. I need to thank Lucinda Illusions for putting up with almost four straight weeks of me spending all evening on the couch muttering about how I'm hitting the goddamn Y and he's not a fucking tacking. Also need to thank Matthew for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. If you'd like to check out his Twitch stream, be sure to check the show notes for a link. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's best bipeds, Mark, Chuck, Stephen, Mike, Kurt, Poss, Minnie, Jolene, Princess of Power, Chris, Cheryl, Jackson, Dylan, Olivia, Rufflebutt, Sarah, Paul, and Mike. Mark, Chuck, Stephen, Mike, and Kurt, whose dicks hit the ground when they pee off the edge of Sky Islands. Poss, Minnie, Jolene, Chris, Cheryl, and Jackson were so badass they could bridle a Lionel. And Dylan, Olivia, Sarah, Paul, and Mike were so bright they don't need bright blooms to explore the depths. Sorry, those all make perfect sense if you play Tears of the Kingdom. Together, these 16 savory secularists supported our serialized sacrilege this week by giving us money. 
Not everybody has the money it takes to give some to us, but if you think you're up to the challenge, you make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash scalingatheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but not in a buying a free thing kind of way, you can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, and following us on social media. And speaking of social media, Tim Robertson takes care of that for us, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. It might be Hokel. I'm not sure. I feel like I've heard Hokel. I thought it was Hokel. Hochul. Yeah. But uh, I've, I don't know that I've ever heard it pronounced, to be honest. I'm I, happy I for her name to be said wrong it. also. Yeah. I'll say it a different way in each. Okay. Iteration. Yeah. There you go. Then, then, then we can just pretend it's a bit. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2023. All rights reserved.